Welcome, everyone. Happy Resurrection Day. Thank you for coming, and thank you, everyone who's online watching. Uh, happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Day. This is uh, the hallmark of Christianity. This is uh, the most important of all the days where Christ was born, and He became the Savior and the sacrifice for the world. Today is where He raises from the dead. We're going we're gonna to talk today about the resurrection and uh, Christ's conquering of death and false gods. Uh, I'm going to be basically covering two general topics today. Uh, before I get into that, I just want to briefly say that uh, as the Lord leads me deeper into studying Scripture, I have a, a growing, a more and more growing desire for the absolute truth of God's Word. And as I go deeper, the more I'm finding is that no one has the whole truth. No doctrine or theology is 100% correct because of so many different avenues that they have taken over time. Uh, I want to premise this by saying that I'm not saying that the, the Scripture that we use today is wrong or bad. Uh, God takes everything and uses it for His glory. But as we have benefited from technology from discoveries such as Qumran with the Dead Sea Scrolls that no one had access to prior to 1947, where so many accusations from the world and from false doctrines and false teachings where they took the Word of God and they interpreted it into something that they felt was correct. The Dead Sea Scrolls come around the oldest example of Scripture that we have. And, of course, it's Old Testament. There's bits and pieces missing. You can't imagine the amount of research that's continuing to still go into these scrolls. Um, 11 caves or 12 caves in Qumran. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, a shepherd boy out in the desert with a bunch of his goats, I'm sure his father's goats, he's throwing rocks. He's What else are you going to do out in the desert? And he's throwing rocks up into some, some caves, up off the, the valley floor, and he hears pottery crash. So he climbs up and looks inside one of the caves and sees all of these clay pots lined up along the cave floor. And so he goes back and tells his father. His father comes. He begins to realize what this may be. And as they looked in some of the busted pottery, he sees scrolls. So then fast forward to today. Archaeologists and, and, and professionals came literally from all over the world. And it has opened up the eyes and the hearts to, to Scripture as it was originally written. Before that, the oldest we had was the Septuagint. And that's where the original Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek. And then during the Second Temple period, the intertestamentary period between the Old and the New Testament, where all of the apostles and everyone were growing up and going to Hebrew school, they were referencing the Septuagint because everybody spoke Greek. And they were reading and learning it from those original texts. Those were the original oldest. Now the Dead Sea Scrolls have come along. And it has proven, without a shadow of a doubt, the accuracy and the purity of God's Word. There's a whole book. The entire book of Isaiah was in, that, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And in there, there was hardly even a dot difference between what they were studying at that time. Thousands of years. God is good. Also, through studying the Dead Sea Scrolls, comparing it with the Septuagint, 
and the translations we have today, we have found some differences. Now, does that make all of it wrong? No. No. God uses what He will for His glory. Millions of people have come to Christ through the, the King James Version of the Bible. But as we delve deeper in, what we began to learn is that they had, during the Second Temple period, a different worldview because of the books that they had studied than what we as modern people have today. So as we delve deeper, as I have delved deeper, and I'm still... It, there's so much to learn. I'll be learning this the rest of my life, praise God. And it's like I've said, I'm prepared to be here a hundred years. I hope I'm not. But I'm prepared to be here a hundred years and do what God tells me to do, and I'll be studying every day. Because it is a brand new adventure every day. But here's here's my point in mentioning all of that. I grew up Southern Baptist. It was about the denomination. It wasn't about all the depths of God's Word. I don't claim a denomination now. And I actually learned this from Brother Ron. I'm a biblicalist. I believe what the Word of God says. Not just a particular translation, but digging as deep as I possibly can, going as far back as I can possibly go, and understanding why they wrote the New Testament the way they wrote it. And there are so many things in the New Testament which, as a young man and as a child, it was impossible for me to understand. But here's the point that I want to make. God's Word should always make sense. There isn't any confusion in God's Word. None. God is a God of order, not of chaos. So when you find areas in Scripture as you read the Bible that you just it just doesn't make any sense, stop and ask yourself, okay, am I reading this because I want it to make sense my way so I can't make it fit? Or am I misunderstanding what it really says? Because the most valuable thing that I've learned so far is that I have to have the perspective that I and everyone else that I come in contact with, listen to, read commentaries on, all of this, all of us are wrong about something. We are, because we're fallible. We have our own points of view. But as we give our lives and our hearts to God, especially when it comes to studying Scripture, and we, we come to Him with humility, we... we just tell the Lord, Father, whatever the truth is, that's what I want to know. No matter who it upsets, no matter what doctrine it insults, no matter what theologians differ with any of the points, the Word of God stands on its own. And don't be afraid that you're going to find something out that completely goes against the gospel or completely goes against, because I'm going to tell you what, when you find the truth, it all lines up perfectly. So, some of this that I have in this lesson today is, is referring to the ancient Hebrew worldview of resurrection, according to Paul. So, the introduction here, and I'm going to go ahead and say, um, with these slides, some of the print may be really small, because instead, of, I didn't want to have a hundred slides and there's just a lot of material here. So uh, if if you, and I know you online, you're really not able to read the slides. Go online, go to the website, and the notes for this and everything that I have on these slides is going to be attached to the, the sermon, the video. So on this blessed time of year where we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it is essential that all believers understand that this blessed event is truly the linchpin of Christianity itself. Today, I would like to go deeper into the narrative as stated by the Apostle Paul of what happened during his resurrection and what it means to all of us who believe and what we have received 
because of the suffering, death, and victory of Jesus Christ. I'm going to be mostly uh, using a scripture, obviously, but I wanted also to touch on um, a particular book that I read, which is still today to me the most excellent example, uh, other than scripture, of the, the proof for Jesus Christ and his death and his resurrection. And that's a book written by Lee Strobel called The Case for Christ. And Lee Strobel, and I would encourage all of you, if you have not read that book, and I mean it goes into way more depth than I'm even going to possibly touch here, uh, but Lee Strobel was an atheist. And he uh, he had won the Pulitzer for investigative reporting. I believe it was in Chicago, it, it, for those who are, yeah. And so uh, after his wife became a Christian, his his whole goal was to prove her wrong. His goal was to prove her wrong. So he put all of his intellect, all of his effort, all of his skill, Pulitzer Prize winner, into investigating and proving that the Bible was wrong and all of this was just a bunch of hooey. I don't know if that's uh, Roman or if that's Greek or if that's Hebrew. <laughs> uh, so anyway, and what he found out through his investigations... Didn't prove his wife wrong, proved him wrong, and he found Christ in the process. It is unbelievable. So I'm going to be using some of his material today, uh, and I'll I'll mention that up front. So, how the resurrection is viewed today, the modern worldview, not mentioning the Christians, but just the modern worldview. There's so many, even contradictory things, but. For example, there is no God. Jesus didn't even exist. Jesus really didn't die on the cross. There was no resurrection. The resurrection cannot be proven scientifically. The witnesses' statements cannot be trusted. The resurrection in the Word of God goes against logic and reason. There is no physical proof. Jesus was not God which is what you hear from Islam. Scripture is merely a fairy tale. You can't trust God's Word. All of these things are straight from hell. I mean, I'm just going to say that. That is exactly what Satan wants you to think. And the majority of the world, they go along with these views because it's comfortable. I love you. I'm not saying this to hurt you but I'm about to hit on this hard. If you thought about more than yourself and you cared more about the truth than being comfortable, you would see the world and life differently. It's all about us. But then you have the Christians. The struggles of modern Christians in Christianity. They have received Christ as Savior and ensured their entrance into heaven that, uh, that have not made Him the Lord of their life, becoming a servant. I mentioned this with, with baptism, but in my view, in my experience, uh, listening to the Holy Spirit and and paying attention to what's on social media and in the news and, and listening to people that I come in contact with. I was sharing with Brother Ron earlier, uh, there's a tremendous amount of undercover Christians in this world. That is the opposite of what we are supposed to be doing. I'm going to touch on that. Are you ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Or do you even believe it? Are you Christian in name only? They may not have a relationship with God. They believe in Him, but don't know Him personally. So where you can pray the prayer and believe upon Christ to be saved, so many people who have done that are not baptized. And one must be, by command, 
baptized to be suitable to receive the Holy Spirit, to receive the seal of the kingdom of God. For when you stand before God, He's looking for that seal of Christ. He's looking for Christ. Everything else is unsuitable, which is also sin. So, either it's due to wrong teachings, and I'm not saying it's always intentional not to be baptized. Most of the time it's due to ignorance or really bad teaching, which is probably of all the things that I get my dander up about is, is the, the wrong teaching that's out today because it's all about being comfortable and inclusive and all of that. Real. But where you have that with baptism, God doesn't want your works and your effort. He wants your heart. When we have another's heart, that is a relationship. God wants your heart. He only looks at your heart in the book of Samuel. So, in the book of James it says, you know, believing's not enough. You know, the devils believe and tremble. I don't think they're going to make it to heaven. Believing's not enough. So making Him the Lord of our life and having a personal relationship with Him where we have laid ourselves bare, because quite frankly, and this is even with marriage, this is in every true scriptural relationship. We are laying ourselves bare before the other. If you have trouble in your marriage, have you actually laid yourself bare before each other? Emotionally, your heart. A whole lot of people's done the physical. It's about the heart. And have you done that before your God? They don't know the Word of God. Or they don't trust the Word of God. I'm going to touch on this later, but the results of our lives, and you're going to hear me say this again later, but it's coming out now. The results of our lives, where we are in our lives, is because of what we believe. Everybody has beliefs. The atheists who say they don't believe in God, well, that's what they believe. But what we believe initiates and instigates and motivates every single thing we do, every choice we make, every direction we go in. It's all based on our beliefs. So, the Word of God is the guide is so much more than that. There's so many things the Word of God is in conjunction with the Holy Spirit, answers every single question and gives you every single direction and shows you everything. The Holy Spirit knows all things. You have to get to a place where you, first of all, are putting the time and effort into knowing the Word of God. And secondly, to a place where you actually trust and believe God's Word. People struggle with belief. They may struggle with their very salvation. And this happens, and I've seen this with a lot of new Christians and young Christians. They struggle and they wonder, am I really saved? It comes down to, first of all, Have you called upon the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you believe that He was the Son of God? Do you believe that He died and was crucified for your sins? And do you believe that He rose again on the third day? I mean, believe it. Past the point of just logical knowledge, but you know it's true. Scripture says that no one comes unto the Father except by the Spirit. 
So that moment of your salvation, you were called by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, of Almighty God. You were called to salvation. And have you repented of your sins before Almighty God? Repenting means go the other way, never to return. Have you closed that door and locked it? Where is your heart? They can't see spiritually, only physically. Can you be saved and this happen? Yeah, you can. But being in the Word of God will help shift your view of life from the physical where it's all about what's happening out here and what my body's feeling into the spiritual, which is what the Word of God associates with. We should read the Word of God with our heart and know that everything is spiritually and kingdom oriented, not physically oriented. Everything in this physical world is a byproduct and a reaction of what happens in the spiritual They don't know the inheritance that they have received through salvation. They don't see how God views them. They don't see or value God's will, which is His desire for family. The ultimate goal is that God recreates Eden here on earth. It's in Revelations. At the end, that's how the story ends. It's all about gathering His family back together and making a new Eden on earth. God is all about family and unity with all of his that, all of those that are his. They put themselves before God. Selfishness has no boundaries between the saved and the unsaved. So, let's go into some of Lee Strobel stuff real quick. The facts uh the facts of re- of uh the resurrection excerpts from the book The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. So, first of all, Jesus lived. He was actually a person. He actually lived on the earth. He was a real, living, breathing person. There is more independent documentation about the man Jesus of Nazareth than there is documentation about the life of George Washington, the first president of the United States. Scholars agree that he was a real person and do not take any other view seriously citing historians such as Josephus, a Jewish scribe for Rome, and not a follower of Christ. It is a non-issue. It's not even a serious argument. Jesus Christ was an actual person on the earth. So secondly, Jesus was tortured, he was crucified, and he died. The flogging itself caused many to die before crucifixion. It was terribly brutal, causing hypovolemic shock due to blood loss. He would have been in serious to critical condition after the flogging. Now, please understand, I'm paraphrasing a whole lot of this stuff that's coming out of this book. So get the book to see all the details. And I didn't want to go into gory details. I mean, the book goes into all of it. Uh, But it's to prove the fact that there's no way he could have survived the crucifixion. The crucifixion nails that were driven through the wrist and feet would have crushed the main nerves in all areas, being extremely painful. This is literally where the word excruciating was invented to describe the pain of Jesus. His shoulders would have been out of joint. He would have been suffocating under his own weight due to the restrictions of his rib cage. He would have gone into heart failure due to hypovolemia, and fluid around the heart, which is called pericardial effusion, and fluid around the lungs, which is called pleural effusion. Then the Roman soldier came around and being fairly certain that Jesus was dead, confirmed it by thrusting a spear into his side. It went through his lung and into his heart. When he pulled it out, some fluid, John stated blood and water in his gospel, came out due to the pericardial and pleural effusions. That's where you have blood and water. There was absolutely no doubt that Jesus was dead. And on top of all of that, the soldiers' lives depended on it. If you didn't do your job in the Roman Empire as a soldier, you were put to death. 
they did not play around. They took everything seriously. And then you have the empty tomb. The empty tomb as an enduring symbol of the resurrection is the ultimate representation of Jesus' claim to be God. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 17 that the resurrection is the very linchpin of the Christian faith. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. The theologian Gerald O'Collins put it this way, In a profound sense, Christianity without the resurrection is not simply Christianity without its final chapter. It is not Christianity at all. The resurrection is the supreme vindication of Jesus' divine identity and His inspired teaching. It's the proof of His triumph over sin and death. It's the foreshadowing of the resurrection of His followers, which is what we're going to be touching on with Paul. It's the basis of Christian hope. It's the miracle of all miracles. Hallelujah. In the face of facts, they have been impotent to put Jesus' body back in the tomb. They flounder, they struggle, they grasp at straws, they contradict themselves, they pursue desperate and extraordinary theories to try to account for the evidence. Yet each time, in the end, the tomb remains vacant. I was reminded of the assessment by one of the towering legal intellects of all time, the Cambridge-educated Sir Norman Anderson, who lectured at Princeton University, was offered a professorship for life at, U at Harvard University, and served as dean of the Faculty of Laws at the University of London. His conclusion, after a lifetime of analyzing this issue from a legal perspective, was summed up in one sentence. The empty tomb then forms a veritable rock on which all rationalistic theories of the resurrection dash themselves in vain. And then we have the evidence of the appearances of Christ after His resurrection. Was Jesus seen alive after His death on the cross? In a conversation with Dr. Gary Habermas, Strobel recalls him stating, here's how I look at the evidence for the resurrection. First, did Jesus die on the cross? And second, did he appear later to people? If you can establish those two things, you've made your case because dead people don't normally do that. I'll start with the evidence that virtually all critical scholars will admit. Nobody questions that Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. And we have him affirming in two places that he personally encounters the resurrected Christ. He says in 1 Corinthians 9, Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? And he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 8, Last of all, he appeared to me also. End quote. I recognize that the last quote attached to the early church creed that Craig Bloomberg and I have already discussed in, in earlier chapters in Lee Strobel's book. As William Lane Craig indicated, the first part of the creed in verses 3 and 4 refers to Jesus' execution, burial, and resurrection. The final part of the creed in verses 5 through 8 deals with his post-resurrection appearances. And here he quotes, out of uh, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes, Christ appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appears to James, then to all the apostles. In the next verse, Paul adds, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. On the face of it, this is incredibly influential testimony that Jesus did appear after, alive after his death. 
Here were names of specific individuals and groups of people who saw him written at a time when people could still check them out if they wanted for confirmation. Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene in John 20, 10 through 18, to the other women in Matthew 28, 8 through 10, to Cleopas and other disciple on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, 13 through 32, to 11 disciples and others in Luke 24, 33 through 49, to 10 apostles and others with Thomas absent and John 20, 19 through 23, that's supposed to be in John. To Thomas and the other apostles in John 20 through 26. To seven apostles in John 21, 1 through 14. To the disciples in Matthew 28 through 6, 16 through 20. And he was with the apostles at the Mount of Olives before his ascension in Luke 24, 50 through 52 and Acts 1, 4 through 9. And on top of that, well, we'll get to that later. So, in the end, there's really no rational doubt. Jesus was killed on the cross. His tomb was empty on Easter morning. His disciples and others saw him, touched him, and ate with him after the resurrection. As prominent British theologian Michael Green said, the appearances of Jesus are as well authenticated as anything in antiquity. There can be no rational doubt that they occurred and that the main reason why Christians became sure of the resurrection in the earliest days was just this. They could say with assurance, we have seen the Lord. They knew it was He. The disciples died for their beliefs. Listen, and this is the point that you hear quoted mostly today. I mean... Hardly anybody has ever gone through the effort that Lee Strobel went through. I'm talking about a lot of documentation and in, in inspection and investigation. But this is a very common truth. It has been proven time and time again that under the threat of death, human beings will not maintain a lie. When you know, especially look at the death some of the ways the apostles died. And even John, who didn't die, he was boiled in oil, and it didn't kill him. He ended up dying on Patmos. But just the threat of being tossed in a huge cauldron of boiling oil, are you going to still lie? You're not going to lie. Not only is it incomprehensible, that the group of people w could maintain a lie for as many years as they lived as Christians. I mean, the, the Watergate lawyers couldn't maintain a lie for, you know, I forget how long it took before they all folded. For those of you who don't know what Watergate is, it was back during the Nixon administration, and there was a lot of bad things going on in politics and robbing and spying going on. But even on a governmental level, they couldn't maintain a lie that long. We're talking decades that the apostles lived their lives in terrible circumstances because of persecution, they never deviated from the truth. But they certainly would not have died in the terrible manners in which they did for a lie. So the conversation, the conversion rather, of skeptics. It's not the simple fact that Paul changed his views. You got to remember who Paul was. Paul was Saul, the Christian killer, before his encounter with Christ. It's not the simple fact that Paul changed his views. You you must explain how he had this particular change of belief that completely went against his upbringing. How he saw the risen Christ in a public event that was witnessed by others. We forget that part. He wasn't the only one there. Even though they didn't understand what was going on and how he performed miracles to back up his claim to being an apostle. Paul was the most educated. He was being groomed 
to one day take over as the leading uh, Sadducee. He was he was one of the most educated Jews in all of the kingdom. He was so radical and devout that he started. He went out to kill Christians at the order of the Jewish Church of the Jewish uh, leaders. So, how does a person who so radically believes, like Paul did, to kill Christians, and all of Jews, as we'll see in a second, their whole entire lives, especially the the men, are built around the Jewish belief system. I mean, every minute detail of their life is controlled by the law the law. How do you go from that into killing Christians into being willing to die for Christ? That that just doesn't happen without an extraordinary life-changing event. So, changes the key social structures. Jewish people did value tradition. They lived in a period in which the older something was, the better. In fact, for them, the farther back they could trace an idea, the more likely it was to be true in their view. So coming up with new ideas was the opposite of the way we are today. These changes to the Jewish social structures were not just minor adjustments that were casually made. They were absolutely monumental changes. This was nothing short of a social earthquake. And earthquakes don't happen without a cause. And then finally, the last point is the emergence of the church. There's no question that the church began shortly after the death of Jesus and spread so rapidly that within a period of maybe 20 years, it had even reached Caesar's palace in Rome. Not only that, but this movement triumphed over a number of competing ideologies and eventually overwhelmed the entire Roman Empire. You probably wouldn't put money on a ragtag group of people whose primary message was that a crucified carpenter from an obscure village had triumphed over the grave. Yet it was so successful that today we name our children Peter and Paul and we name our dogs Caesar and Nero. I like the way C.F.D. Moulet, the Cambridge New Testament scholar, put it. If the coming into existence of the Nazarenes, a phenomenon undeniably attested by the New Testament, rips a great hole in history, a hole the size and shape of a resurrection, what does the secular historian propose to stop it up with? If someone wants to consider this circumstantial evidence and reach the verdict that Jesus did not rise from the dead, fair enough. But they've got to offer an alternative explanation that is plausible for all of these facts. It's the ongoing encounter with the resurrected Christ that happens all over the world in every culture to people from all kinds of backgrounds and personalities, well-educated and not, rich and poor, thinkers and feelers, men and women, they all will testify that more than any single thing in their lives, Jesus Christ has changed them. To me, this provides the final evidence, not the only evidence, but the final confirming proof that the message of Jesus Christ can open the door to a direct encounter with the risen Christ. Praise the Lord. Guys, y'all read that book if you haven't. I'm telling you, it is awesome. There's nobody that can read that whole book and then argue anything else. He proves it it all in there. For, For those that require proof. So... Paul's view of the resurrection and our place as sons and daughters of God. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. That was the thing that Paul was called to do. 
Now, of course, as we remember, Gentiles are us. It's, it's those who are not born of the Jewish, uh, the Jewish people. Even though Paul was a Jew, he was the apostle to the Gentiles and considered all New Covenant believers in Christ as Israel. One of the things you learn when you start digging into Scripture and how they wrote it and the Hebrew understanding of things, first of all, Hebrew words, one word has multiple meanings based on how it's written and what it's written with, context and all that. But when they mention Israel, they're mentioning the covenant people, not Jews, but covenant people. The reason you know this is because if Israel meant just Jewish people, and they were all under a covenant, that means none of them would have turned away from God. They had all been under the covenant, and that's not what happened. Many of them went apostate and started worshiping other gods and doing all this crazy stuff. So Israel means the covenant people of God. So Paul sees us through the new covenant with Jesus Christ as Israel. All of us who have accepted Christ as our Savior and our Lord are Israel in Paul's eyes. So when you read Paul in all of his books and writings, from that perspective, you begin to understand it differently. You see it differently. Paul stated many times, both Jews and Gentiles. In the following passages, Paul links our status in Christ as being set apart new creatures, sons and daughters of God. We are God's portion, His property, and His dominion. We as Israel, the covenant people. Why does Paul link his description of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, 35, and 50 to forbid idolatry in Deuteronomy chapter 4? We must remember as we read all of Scripture, especially when reading the New Testament, that the New Testament writers had an ancient Hebrew worldview, as I mentioned earlier. They all used the Old Testament Scriptures as the foundation for all of their writing. The Old Testament isn't outdated. It is necessary. It is the foundation of the New Testament. They wrote in a way where they assumed the readers shared the same worldview as they did. you got to understand, everybody went to Hebrew school back then. They assumed a lot of people would understand the nuances in the, in the re references that he's about to make with these two points I'm going to show you. They already just kind of understood, and most of them did know Scripture well enough that they caught the nuances and the, the references that Paul was referring to. To them, the Old and New Testaments fit seamlessly together. He is using the idols of the fallen nations in Deuteronomy as examples of death and those people who are outside of God's covenant. He is showing that there is no life in any God but through Christ and our Father in heaven. And what we worship is what we give our lives to. What we give our lives to is what we worship. And you'll hear that again in a minute. So, in 1 Corinthians 15, 35-50, Paul's writing about the resurrection body. Starting at 35, But someone will ask, How are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. This is talking about our salvation. You have to die before you can be risen again. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps wheat or some other grain. I like to think of acorns. I just think of acorns when I hear that. But God gives it a body as He has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, 
But there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. Now, I underlined and highlighted that point because that's part of Deuteronomy chapter 4. Old Testament. And you're going to find this out in a minute. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly one is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For stars differ from stars in glory. So you've got the physical and you've got the spiritual, or the glory. Paul wants us understanding that the physical has to die in order for the spiritual to find and obtain the glory that God intends. And God makes you what you are in spirit. Now, let me finish on. So it so is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor and it's raised in glory. This is talking about your salvation now. It is sown in weakness and it is raised in power. It is sown in a natural body and it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, and the last Adam, Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. But it is not spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. And this is also highlighted. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust, and is of heaven, and is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. And then the last part in 50, it says, with mystery and victory. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. So, this is the New Testament. This is the writer. This is, this is Paul who is going to reference Deuteronomy chapter 4, and I'm going to show you where he does it right here. And you can look at the underlying parts and start recognizing something familiar. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully. And this is about idolatry forbidden. This is do not have any other gods before me. If you delve into the book of Deuteronomy, first of all, Jesus, he referenced Deuteronomy a lot. I think more than any other book, if I'm not mistaken. But what you're going to see is the ancient Hebrew worldview, how they understood things based on the Septuagint and also the first book of Enoch. And also, now that we see, things were corroborated with the Dead Sea Scrolls in their original states. This is just the history that they learned. But where you've got the, the, the three different uh, rebellions against God, first with Adam and Eve in Genesis, and then second where uh, the sons of God come down and mate with the women and the Nephilim and all that, which is the crazy weird stuff nobody likes to hear about because they think it's weird. It's in there. It's in Scripture. And then, of course, that's what corrupted all of mankind. And then, of course, then the flood happens, and then they come and do it again after the flood. It says that in Scripture. Moses wrote that. And then after that... Uh, then you had where God said, look, and he, he sat Noah down, God did. He said, and he reiterated all of the commands that he gave to Adam. He's like, we're going to do this again. We're going to start all over, Noah. We're going to start with you guys. And so here are my commandments, and I want you guys to uh, multiply, be abundant, and, and fill the earth with their descendants. And again, God wanting everybody to be in one big family and instead what happened was that all of mankind refused to spread out all over the earth and they all stayed in one spot and said, let's build a tower. Now, why did they do that? The tower, and if you look at ancient Babylonian uh, culture and all of that, they built those towers in religious complexes to draw the God to their presence. So the towers were built for God, their God to inhabit. Okay. Well, God's like, no, that's not what I said to do. I told you to spread out across the earth. 
So because of that, and looking at what they built by all working together, then he confused the languages and he scattered them across the earth into all the nations. And then it says in Scripture here, this isn't some crazy Bible, this is the Bible, okay? It says in Scripture that he associated a member of the heavenly council to each nation. God divorced himself from mankind except for Israel. Israel isn't mentioned in there because in the next chapter is when God approaches Abram and he creates Israel from Abram, which later became Abraham. But all the other nations, he's like, look, you guys go, you're each assigned a nation. I'm, I'm done with these people. You, you lead them righteously, teach them about me, worship me. And and at some point, God's going to recollect all the nations. All this stuff is in Scripture. So we get to the place where we're looking at why is Paul mentioning and, and, and referring back to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Well, Deuteronomy chapter 4 says, Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully, since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb, out of the midst of the fire. Beware lest ye act corruptly, making a carved image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, and the likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth. And beware lest ye raise up your eyes to heaven and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars. Now, everything that was listed right there was in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul's referring to the same thing in the same order, except for where it says reptiles or the crawly things. He didn't mention that, but he didn't mention it in Genesis either. They didn't mention it. But he's, he's in order listing them under the same things because all of these things were gods that the, all these other non-covenant people across the earth worshipped. He's, uh, he's linking idolatry and what resurrection did by defeating it together using Deuteronomy chapter 4. He's showing the power of the resurrection by conquering all other Id idols and gods of all the un uh, unbelieving nations. Christ conquered all of it. All the hosts of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them. He's saying, beware of these things. Things that the Lord your God has allotted to all people under the whole heaven. He's saying these are natural things of the earth that everybody sees. And here's the most important part, 20. But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to be a people of His own inheritance as you are this day. This is in Deuteronomy. Paul is referring to this saying, the resurrection conquers any perceived idol and God of anything anybody's going to worship in nature, whether it looks like a man or a woman or a bird or a fish or whatever, or sun and moon and stars, it conquers all of it. And you are God's chosen people. Israel, you are the covenant children of God. He's trying to get people to understand. See yourself the way God sees you. Understand how God sees you. And live how He expects you to live. Don't have idols. God hates that, obviously, because He has struggled with it so many times throughout history probably more than just about anything else. You will have no other gods before me. So, here's some questions. The premise is that we do not worship what doesn't bear God's likeness. For many of these things, all of these things, none of them bear God's likeness, but things of this world. Paul links the worldly idols that we give our lives to as rulers, principalities, and powers. Does that sound familiar? All of these are geographical descriptions going back to the nations. 
split up. They all have powers and principalities and rulers of all these different nations. This is all tied together. But when all of these when all of these uh, heavenly hosts that God put in charge of each one of these nations, they all turned on God. That was the third rebellion. First they rebelled at Babel, and then the final part of that rebellion is when they all turned on God, and they said, don't worship Yahweh, worship me. That's where idol worship came from across the earth. Worship me, don't worship God. Same thing Satan said. Same thing Satan said to Jesus. Worship me. So these powers and principalities and rulers of the age, as Paul describes where we're fighting spiritual warfare, so to speak, we don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against powers and principalities and rulers. He mentions all of this. This is what he's referring to. These are still in existence today until the final coming. So these, these things that these are the exact things that we are attacked by and have strongholds in our lives. These are what we fight against when loving and helping others break free from strongholds. The very things that we make idols in our lives are the things that create strongholds in our lives. It's insidious. The very things that we make idols in our lives, what we give our lives to, what we give our time and our attention and our stress and our money and all of these, that we give our lives to it, are the very things that create strongholds in our lives. And that is a power and a principality because it's an idol. It is an idol. We do this by receiving the power of salvation, breaking people free of these strongholds. By the power of salvation, the resurrected Christ, and the Holy Spirit, by the one true God and His Son, Jesus. Resurrection isn't just about rising from the dead, but also about a change of nature into the likeness of Christ's resurrected state. And this is what Paul's describing in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Just as Jesus is, so are we. We are elected, we are set apart through Christ and His resurrection. Our election removes us from under the bondage and dominion that the God of this world and His principalities control. We have been broken free. None of it applies to us, Israel, the children of God, the sons and daughters of God through Jesus Christ. So finally, as Israel was brought to life, because remember, when, when God uh, he scattered them across and created all the nations and the boundaries, as it says in Scripture, Israel didn't exist at that point. Israel was created out of nothing, through Abraham. So as Israel was brought to life and set apart by God through Abraham, we have been brought to life and set apart through Christ. It's a mirroring. And you'll see this as you delve deep into Scripture. God mirrors events and things in His will and His plan over and over again. And what does that do? It's something you can refer back to and say, that was God right there. That's why He does it. What are the idols that we are being wor that are being worshipped today by both Christians and non Christians? Wealth and riches, mammon. Self interest, that's the biggest, I think. Everything's about us. Fame, glory, and power, people in our lives that we put before God, and there's so many more things I just put, etc. Do any bear the likeness of Christ? No. Our beliefs direct what we give our lives to. And this is called worship. There are only two categories of how we live. Spiritually with our eyes on eternity and living by faith where we have no other God but Yahweh and His Son Jesus Christ. 
or physically, where all things are temporary and we live in unbelief where all things die. Everything in this world is going to die. It's going to rot away and it's going to turn to dust. No matter what you're spending your time and energy and money on, it's all going to go away. An old saying I grew up with is, the shine wears off. It was sparkly and new at first, but then the shine wore off. And your heart changes about it. But then it's too late because you've given your life to it. You've given your life to it. There are only two categories, like I said, skipping down. What is worship today in this physical world is useless in eternity. None of it matters. What one worships, one gives power to in this life. Your attention is worship. Your attention is a type of worship. How much of your attention is in the Word of God? In prayer, thanksgiving, fasting? These are rhetorical questions, but I ask you to ask yourself. God knows, and He's longing for you. God's heart longs for you in that relationship. As sons and daughters of God, we are to be about the business of undoing the works of Satan. We have the responsibility to suppress the rulers, powers, and principalities, idols, because the resurrection of Christ has defeated them. As sons and daughters of God, we have the responsibility to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to all nations of the earth. We are to finish what the apostles began in reclaiming the nations for God through Christ and bring in the fullness of the Gentiles, making the way for, of the return of Israel to the true Messiah, Jesus Christ. We all have a job to do. We have a responsibility. We were never meant to be idle. It was never supposed to be just about us and our problems. God is greater than all of that. And the last point I'm going to make, and then we're going to pray, is this. We get so focused on physical that we think we've got all the time in the world. Well, I know I'm not really right right now, but I've got time. Listen, you've got to understand things from God's perspective. As it says in scriptures, a thousand years is like a day and a day is like a thousand years. What that means is, is that he's in the thick of it right now. God's in the thick of things right now. Now, if you were the boss and you hired somebody to do a job and they said, I'll get to it eventually, would they stay employed? God sees all of this not under a time frame like we do. That's the point. God sees it as, I say it, I speak it into existence, it happens, you do it. Here's my word, read my word, know my word, you will learn what to do and what not to do. I will send my spirit and have sent my spirit to show you and tell you what to do. When, where, how, and why. It all comes down to obedience. It's not procrastination. It's disobedience. So I encourage all of us who are children of God to know your place, to know your responsibility, and to know Him intimately. So that we can continue to accomplish what it is that we are here for. It's all about God's glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for Your truth. We thank You for Your love, most of all. We thank You for the fact that in spite of our ignorance, 
our selfishness, our disobedience, you still love us as your child. We thank you, Father, that you see us and speak of us as we will be. And though we have already reached the point that you would like, we have not yet reached what we are going to be through your glory. Father, we just ask that you encourage all of those who are listening and who are here and they're discouraged. We ask you to encourage them that you are with them, that you are strengthening them, and that they feel your presence and love around them, Father. Let your face shine so brightly and reflect off of us that the world sees your light through us. Glorify yourself in the midst of our circumstances, Father, and keep us ever mindful that your glory is supreme and reigns. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray this prayer. Amen. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-